Why did you come to the conclusion that this was going to be a good plane for Canada? It starts back in, in the mid-90s with um, a, a realization in the United States specifically, but also in a number of other countries, that the that, that airplanes such as the F-16, the F-18, uh, were going to come to the end of their useful life at a certain point. And some of the things that the F-16 program had shown, which is that uh, if, if you build an airplane and a lot of other countries operate it, uh, essentially there are, there are economies that can be realized in that regard. So what, what the um, realization was in that time frame was they were looking to try and do something that would, would be, I guess, a little bit unprecedented. It would be they were looking for the best airplane that would last a long time in the order of 40 to 50 years and be delivered at the best price. And, if, mm -hmm. and, th and that essentially was the, the foundation of the Joint Strike Fighter program. One of the, the main attractions to it from other countries uh, other than the United States was an opportunity to not only know more, but also have an opportunity to influence things at earlier stages in the program than we, would, than we ever had before. And when Canada was involved, you, you were, uh, if not necessarily chief of the air staff or all of that process, but we're aware of it. Was it your understanding that we were involving ourselves in this process because we intended to buy this, this plane? Uh, I guess uh, if we had intended not to buy, it would not have made any sense to be involved. And so, so therefore, at some point in time in the future, that possibility certainly existed. Uh, we, in, uh, to become involved, you actually had to put some upfront money, which we did. Um, that gave us uh, opportunities, uh, an opportunity to, uh, mm -hmm. to have visibility into the program as, as it was developing. It gave us opportunities to, uh, to influence things if we thought there were things that were specific to Canada. We amongst a working group would have an opportunity to, 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 to have our say. This, mm -hmm. this is a, as mentioned before, was unprecedented. Uh, the third thing, it also allowed uh, Canadian industry to begin to participate once again at a level that, uh, that we've, we've not seen before. This gave them the opportunity to be part of something that might be three, you know, in the order of 3,000 aircraft. So instead of being uh, involved in a very small number of aircraft uh, to a larger extent, we'd be involved to a smaller extent, but, but uh, across a much, much larger number of aircraft, not only at, at the development of, of, of actually building it, but then in the long-term maintenance of it as well. Both of those are really, really significant. Was it your understanding that Canada would in fact have a competition at some point to determine which was the best aircraft for its needs? As far as I was concerned, we were, it was part of a competitive process, whether you would actually call it a competition. This, the Joint Strike Fighter program was the first of a new way of doing business. That, uh, it, and it, was, it brought uh, significant upside to it. One of the things that was going to be different about it, it was unlikely to result in a competitive process or a competition much along the lines of what we have seen in, in other times. Why? Because uh, essentially uh, um, you were, as a partner nation, you, um, you contributed, uh, you had opportunities, um, but to, to hold a true competition you would actually have to step back from being a partner nation. You would actually have to get out of the partnership to be part of a Canadian style competition. And at some point in time, someone may decide that that's what they want to do, but there are significant risk and downside to doing that. What would, would have been the risk? Because I, I, I've looked at the MOUs and I, I know that it says quite specifically that, uh, that member countries uh, are, first of all, not obliged to buy the that's plane. That's absolutely correct. And second of all, are uh, perfectly free to undergo their own process and choosing whatever they want to do. Uh, so why could Canada not have had a competition? Well, uh, as soon as you step outside, you are no longer a partner. So therefore, you're at the back of the bus as far as it, as it comes to uh, delivery of the aircraft. Uh, you're probably going to end up paying more money. And in addition, you're now going to, as I mentioned from um, before, the, uh, when it comes to, the, to on the industry side, your industry is now probably only going to be looking at providing bits and pieces for 65 aircraft or, or the offsets for that. You're no longer inside the organization competing with the 3,000. You also begin to lose your influence, or you, in fact, you have no influence at that point in time about, about what happens in the future. So it, it, it is a decision that, that could be taken, but it, it, you would only take that if you actually believed that being inside was actually not where you wanted to be. Well, and, and to do that, you would have to know what the alternatives were, what the other planes out there were that you might want fact, to buy. And uh, in fact, uh, while I was chief of the air staff and we were leading up to that 
third phase, uh, our staff were out doing exactly that. They were talking to all of the other aircraft that were likely to be competitors uh, for the F-35, and they were uh, chronicling and detailing information on those aircraft, uh, not necessarily to, to eliminate them, um, but to simply say, we see that the Joint Strike Fighter, or we see the F-35, as still being extremely competitive, and therefore it, it, we're preserving the opportunities to benefit from being inside the arrangement as mm -hmm. opposed to moving outside the arrangement. How exhaustive was that survey that you did of all the possibilities? It uh, involved two, two steps. Uh, certainly we, uh, we went out and did a, uh, a, a documentation uh, examination. We, that was step one, was mm -hmm. to, 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 to gather the information and to study it. Step two, which we, we then sent a team to each of the nations and each of the countries uh, to talk to them specifically about their aircraft. So we sent a team to Sweden, to Saab, to talk to them about the Gripen. We sent a team to France to talk to them about the, the, the Rafale. We sent a team to England to talk to them about Typhoon, with the Eurofighter. We sent a team down to Boeing to talk to them about the Super Hornet. And of course, we were also at the same point in time talking to the, uh, to the people about, uh, about the Lightning II, the F-35. And certainly from absolutely everything I saw, it was definitely reasonable to go forward. In, in 2006, with the information we had, it, it, it looked very much like they were going to be able to deliver on the best aircraft uh, that was going to last with us for the longest time and at the best price. All right. Well, speaking of that, there's a couple of documents that, uh, that we have here that, hap that were written during your time, and maybe I can just... Sure. We can just talk about them and you can explain to them. One of them was in a, a briefing note that was sent to the Minister of Defense in September of 2006. Okay. And in that, um, I'll just read you uh, a paragraph here. It says, in May 2006, CAS, I'm assuming that's your office. That would be me, yes. <laughs> completed an options analysis study that examined the global market for the next generation tactical fighter aircraft. The results of this study have indicated that the JSF family of aircraft provides, quote, the best available operational capabilities to meet Canadian operational requirements while providing the longest service life and the lowest per aircraft cost of all op options considered. In fact, I think the words that, uh, that were used there are very similar and paraphrase the words that I, I just mentioned to you. Sure. Now, we also um, have uh, obtained um, what I believe is the, the document that details the survey that you spoke of, of the, of the various other options that were available at the time. And the one thing that strikes me in reading through it is at the bottom of every page in which a different fighter is analyzed, it always makes a point of saying that there was a lot of information that was not available. So I'm wondering how, and this was written in June of 2006, mm -hmm. At a time when your own analysis was saying, look at, we don't have all the information on the others, how you could then, two months later, three months later, write to the minister saying, we've done an analysis and we're convinced the F-35 is the best. Yes, indeed, it does say at the bottom, more information uh, uh, is needed. Um, but I guess, um, I guess I would characterize that as this is an appropriate level of examination for where we were at at that point in time. And that's really what our recommendation was in 2006, that we believe there's sufficient information at this point in time for us to go forward, sign off on the next, uh, on the next uh, phase of the, uh, of the activity, uh, knowing that there would be subsequent examination, uh, more detailed examination as we develop the statement of requirement. And was there subsequent examination, do you know? To the best of my knowledge, yes, because that would be part of the normal process of doing, of, of doing business, and, and I had confidence that that would happen in the in the force in the, in the future. So we know now, and and he has testified in front of uh, Commons committees that the the head of Boeing has said, look at you know nobody ever got from us the kind of information that they would have been required for us for anybody to make a, an evaluation of our plane versus the F-35. Well, of course, you can expect the head of Boeing to be able to make such a statement. Um, I, once again, I believe you, you, can, uh, you can make a determination without having 100% of the information. I think you can make a determination based upon a high percentage of the information, and I believe 
the Air Force would have made that determination uh, and, and made that recommendation based on the belief they had sufficient information to go forward with that. Mm -hmm. Even in 2006, at the time you were making this recommendation that we needed to stay in the program and go forward, if you look at the reports that were coming out of the General Accounting Office in the United States, there were already lots of red flags. At one point, they're talking about uh, costs being up, cost estimates being up 80%. At one point, the, uh, the, uh, the Pentagon is already downgrading the number of planes that it's going to buy. Uh, the GAO looks at their, the business model that Lockheed has put forward and says, this is unexecutable. Well, uh, there is an awful lot of information. There's a lot of different perspectives in that. Yes, indeed, we, we uh, obviously uh, we heard those, those words. Uh, we, uh, we took them into account. But at the same point, um, the, the, the promise of delivering on the best aircraft that would last for 50 years and, and be cheapest um, was, was still something that, uh, that was, was in our minds. You still thought it was going to be the cheapest, even though the cost estimates were up 80 percent? There has never the been a defense procurement program that was not behind to one extent or another or over budget to one another extent. Uh, that, that, that is, a, that is a, fe a feature of of those kinds of programs. I, uh, so was it a reason for us to to uh, to, to get scared and uh, and run? Absolutely not. The information that we had and, uh, and certainly I'm, I'm extremely confident uh, about this was that it, it was at that point in time and, and to the best of my knowledge still is on course to deliver a great airplane at a great price. I mean, you, you say it's the best plane, but there's an awful lot of criticism out there. I mean, you mentioned the F-16, for instance. We did an interview with Pierre Spray, who, who was instrumental in developing the F-16. He thinks the F-35 is, in his words, a turkey. He says, look, this is a plane that because it's been designed to fulfill, you know, to, to please so many masters and fulfill so many roles, it doesn't do any of them well. I believe that there, for every individual of that nature who says there's two or three more on the other side who are saying this is going to be a very good uh, airplane. Not only, you see, we aren't the only ones who think this. Uh, uh, you have to remember in this partnership of ours there is the, uh, the Brits, uh, the United Kingdom, Australia, mm -hmm. uh, large nations or larger nations like ourselves. There are smaller ones as well like Norway, uh, the Netherlands, Turkey all interested in the purchase of this aircraft, all conducting their own examinations and all coming to the, the same uh, a, agreement that this is the right airplane for them as well. In terms of the defense of Canada and the size of Canada, you are replacing the CF-18 uh, two-engine plane uh, with one that has one engine and that, as I understand or I'm told, is not as fast, doesn't have the same range. How, how can you say it's a better plane? It has a very reliable single engine which allows it, it which makes it less complex um, if you look at the reliability of engines over the last number of years, you will see that a single engine aircraft right now, in actual fact, has more reliability than, than, than two engine aircraft of the past. I'm not a pilot, but if I'm flying up in the Arctic mm -hmm. Circle, I'd like to know that I had a backup if something went wrong with that engine, wouldn't I? That was one of the rationale behind why we selected the F-18 back in the, in the mid-70s but an awful lot has changed between then and now. It used to be that when we used to fly over the ocean, we, uh, we insisted upon four engines, uh, and now we're down to uh, two aircraft that fly regularly across the ocean with two engines. So I believe that, that a single engine is, is not an issue with respect to uh, now. I, I believe that, that that won't be an issue uh, in the future, that the reliability of the aircraft or the, the reliability of that engine will allow it to perform all of the things that we want it to, even in the difficult circumstances we face in Canada. Everybody comes back to what distinguishes this plane is the, the so-called fifth generation designation, mm -hmm. the, the so-called stealth. What, what does that mean in, in ordinary terminology? When you say stealth, what does it mean? Essentially it means that you are able to get very close to someone without them even knowing that you are there. Are you invisible? Uh, you are not, invisibility would suggest that you couldn't be seen with the naked eye, but, but in terms of the distances that normally fighters operate one from another or a fighter would operate uh, in terms of distances from a bomber, essentially uh, visibility isn't, uh, you're being able to see with the naked eye is not an issue. But are you convinced that the, 
the radar evading technology of the F-35 will, in fact, evade radars. I mean, again, Pierre Spray, who knows about some mm -hmm. of the stuff, he's not just an opinion, says, you know, the, the, the Russians are making uh, radars, have been making them since World War II. There's no way that you can build a radar-proof plane. Well, I guess what, what's really interesting then is, is if the Russians don't believe that this is such a good idea, why are they developing their own fifth generation aircraft themselves, as are the Chinese? They believe in it as well, and that's why they're doing it. Well, maybe they're building a better one. I would hope not. Uh, I, believe, I believe actually uh, the, um, the, the technologies and the people uh, who are involved in them from the, uh, from the, the, um, comp the countries that make up right. the, uh, the, uh, the partnership here, um, we have some very good people. We have some, uh, it, I, this will be a great airplane. So you keep telling me, but I, I, I'm also listening to lots of people who have well, big reservations about that. People who did the study in Canada were people who are very good friends of those who are ultimately going to fly these aircraft. They aren't doing it for anything other than a belief that this is the best aircraft. You don't get any prizes for finishing second in an air-to-air -air combat. Nobody wants to put their friends, their colleagues, into an airplane in a situation where they're going to come out second best if they have a choice.